So, um, yeah, uh, you guys have seen the poster, obviously, and thanks for coming. Uh, this is Sam Rocha. He's teaching down at University of North Dakota. Um, the department is Educational Foundations and Research. And uh, I kind of stumbled across Sam's PhD one day. I, I still can't remember how, <laughs> but it was a very, uh, very enlightening and inspiring, and it kind of sent me off on a, a whole new trajectory and provided me with another language to think about things. And uh, eventually, we got in touch with each other and been talking ever since. And uh, we thought it'd be a great idea to come up here and present some of his work. And uh, as is usually custom. We would present you with some tobacco, uh -huh. uh, since you're coming to share a story with us uh -huh. and knowledge, and I feel like a total ass because we don't have any tobacco for you. I brought tobacco. And in fact, <laughs> Sam brought me some tobacco yes, today, that's right. some camel cigarettes, so <laughs> the, the process has been reversed here, there you go. But uh, and some Mexican Coca-Colas, yes. so yeah. I hope you can forgive me for that, but uh, without further ado, uh, join me in welcoming Sam Rocha. Well, I brought gifts as well uh, for everyone. So I brought you a copy of some music um, to, so to share. Uh, to give it first. And um, so I'm gonna move in, th in three parts uh, today talking about um, two distinctions and then uh, a, what I wanna call a sort of false distinction uh, in the third. So the first one will be on uh, being and meaning. And then the second distinction will be the dis distinction between showing and saying and then uh, that'll all come together and in some sense breaking down the distinction between phenomenology and folklore. Um, and, uh, and I'm gonna use music uh, as I move along and I'm, this is very experimental on the music side. I was saying this before. When I've used music, um, it kind of feels a little shtickish or kind of, uh, it hasn't felt very natural, but I'm, I'm gonna, today I'm really gonna make an effort to make the music in some sense uh, the feature part of, of the talk, and the talking be less so. So I'm going to start off with a song. Uh, it's a song called Eggs with Love. Um, and uh, when I was teaching at Wabash in Indiana, um, sometimes my students would come to my house and just do work at my dining room table, and I'd be there working. And at about 2, we'd get hungry, so I'd make some eggs. <laughs> and uh, some of my students talked about how, uh, how good my eggs were. I said, well, it's because they're eggs with love. That's why they're so good. <laughs> and uh, so that's the thing behind um, behind the song. And uh, some of the themes in the song uh, will come out, but more of this is just kind of to set the thing. So this is Eggs with Love. <laughs> Sometimes you gotta lie to tell the truth. 
Sometimes you gotta lie to tell the truth. Sometimes you gotta lie to tell the truth. But tell your lies with love. Tell your lies with love. Tell your lies with So, um, I want to move right into this uh, part on the uh, handout, um, this kind of, these two boxes. Okay. Did you there, uh, what was that? Do you have any more? Yeah, they're right up there. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, I think there's this sort of fundamental conflict. Um, I'm going to actually start off on the beginning. There seems to be this, this real kind of rift or this conflict between folklore on the one hand and phenomenology on the other hand. And I've been in some sense doing both. But I've been doing folklore more often than that. I've been I've been playing guitar since I was five. And so that's always been part of what I've been doing. Um, and uh, and I've only recently, within maybe the last 10 years, begun to study and work on phenomenology. And uh, just within maybe the last year has that kind of gap, have I been trying to kind of fill that gap. and. Um, the distinction between being and meaning is, in some sense, the first step I take to trying to fill that gap. And so, if you if you look at these two boxes here, um, one thing that's very important is that I, I'm only interested in things. Right? Things are like all I, my interests are in. So, insofar as I have any interest in authors or in philosophers or in theorists, it's only insofar as they help me understand things better. But things are sort of the only thing I have any interest in at, at, as an academic or whatever. And I think to some level we all have interest in things, so I hope, you know, it's kind of a, maybe it's a universal interest. Um, but I've always found it very curious the way people look at these two boxes here. So um, uh, when you say, what do you see, uh, you know, it's kind of obvious, you know, we don't have to torture it too much. Um, and then I ask a sort of rhetorical question, is there, does there seem to be a difference between the objects in the two boxes? And most people tend to say yes. I, mean, I don't think anybody would object too strongly to the idea that there are two different things. Um, in fact, I would argue that you could actually, I could have in some sense the same thing in each box, but they would still be different things because the stuff in the box on the left would be different than the stuff on the box on the right, insofar as the stuff on the box on the left is not the stuff that's in the stuff on the box on the right, right? So there, there's at least this kind of basic difference. So you don't need, so the objects, the things aren't, super important here, their placement kind of distinguishes them. When we get into the question of description, and description is what I take phenomenology to be, it's a descriptive uh, method in some ways, a method of describing things. Um, this is where things get a little bit tricky. Um, most people seem to want to, to describe the difference between the objects and the two things and a, uh, by, by inference that there's a sort of some kind of connection between the two things, right? That, a dotted line is sort of the, uh, um, they get into semiotics and all that stuff, you know. That this, um, but if you ask a child um, uh, what's the difference between those two things, they're going to talk about them in terms of shape and color almost every time. So on the left we see um, some things that are uh, black on a white surface and they, uh, they, they move depending on how you read them, you know, left to right, right to left, middle to outside but they move along a basically horizontal plane. And they're not 100% uniform, but they're, they're, they have some similarities to each other. They look alike enough. And, uh, and they're about, you know, one, two, about two and a quarter inches long. That is the thing on there. And the thing on the right is very different. Um, it doesn't share uh, many of the properties aside from being black on a white surface. Um, but it has, uh, the shapes are very different. They, they move in curls and loops and sticks and, uh, 
and they kind of sit on a horizontal line, but it's not nearly as, as defined on the other side. Um, and so if I was to, if someone was to write this up into sort of a descriptive uh, account of what's there, my argument is that um, what is precedes what the thing that is means, right? So at a later stage, one could say, well, a dotted line also happens to be the, uh, the linguistic expression in the English to describe the object in the other box. That's fine, I'm not rejecting that out of hand. But I do want to argue that there is this sort of preliminary phase that often gets skipped over that I think is very important, which is uh, just the bare thing itself that presents sensorially, not as language or narrative or anything, but just as a thing, right? just as an object. And um, the implications this has, uh, I think are fairly, I think they're significant. Because um, we generally, um, especially after this last century, we've had this kind of strong linguistic turn, this kind of narrative turn, where everything has become hermeneutic, everything has become an epistemological object. Yet at the very same time, um, I, I, don't, um, I don't know of any time in which um, narrative has taken the place of things. So when we consider narrative as a thing, that's one thing, but whenever we consider narrative as taking the place of a thing, that is to say, whenever meaning begins to sort of replace being itself, there I think we have something a little bit strange and something that kind of worries me. Um, I think there's some other people who are worried about this too. Um, uh, Zizek says that Lacan is very worried about this. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, but, uh, but my basic worry is this, is that whenever everything becomes epistemological, whenever everything is trans, whenever meaning is what gives us purchase on the world and on reality, as it were, um, then it's not so much that we're uh, changing things, but that we are changing a certain order of things, right? And so my work begins with a rather um, old-fashioned sense of order. <laughs> and it wants to argue that the order of being uh, precedes and insofar as it precedes, also exceeds the order of meaning. That is to say that things uh, have to be in order to mean something. And things that mean something presuppose their being. Right? And this seems, I mean, you're probably all saying, we came to listen to this guy tell us this, right? What a stupid <laughs> idiot. Um, in some sense, actually, it, it is almost idiotic that, we, that, that someone's work could go off of this. However, I think anyone who's attentive to the literature and the conversations and the nature of the way we talk about things, it's very clear, it doesn't take very long at all to realize that there is this kind of epistemological tyranny right now that reigns over the academy and reigns over um, uh, theoretical work that actually, in my view, um, wants to invert the order between meaning and being, right? Wants to argue that meaning is the means through which being comes into the world. And this, in my mind, is not only a, mis is not only a mistake uh, epistemologically, but it's an ontological mistake. That is to say, it, um, it inverts our experience of reality. Right? So whenever we experience the reality in front of us in these two boxes, I want to argue, um, uh, this, we forget that we know that there are shapes and colors in front of us. And we pretend as though, at some level, uh, we pretend as though there's something other than shape and color in front of us in the first place. And in my mind, that's the, that's the sort of psychic inversion that, 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 that's been going on for some time. And uh, I know that in education, and social justice studies, and peace studies, and, you know, so it, it's been, it, people have tried to leverage this move to sort of advocate for bare objects you know, forms of life, whatever. My argument, though, is that it's all it's going to do, even if it's sort of altruistic in, in, in scope, ultimately what it ends up doing is actually imposing a, uh, a second-order epistemology to first-order ontology. Right? So this is, this is the basic distinction uh, between being and meaning. It's, it's not something that uh, I think is very difficult to understand. I think we experience things this way. In some sense, I think children are probably more apt <laughs> to understand this distinction than academics are. But nonetheless, it's sort of the, the, uh, the governing uh, assumption of, of my work. Here's the, uh, in some sense, crazy theory.
theoretical claim that follows from it. If being precedes and exceeds meaning, then being has to be sufficient. In other words, it's enough to be, right? Being is enough. In other words, the objects in front of us are sufficient as shapes and colors. They don't need meaning to be. Uh, we can add meaning to them if we'd like to. Um, but insofar as they are, they are. And their are-ness or their being is a sufficient condition for their own existence. They don't need anything else. What follows from that is to say that being is meaningless. In other words, that being uh, does not require meaning in order to be. In fact, that being can be without meaning, and that our experience of being doesn't need, in some sense, to be mediated through meaning. Now this is, I think, more difficult whenever you put the human being as a filter, because a lot of people assume that the moment you sort of sense being, you create meaning. Um, but my objection to that is, uh, is I think, very, uh, very clear. And, and, it, and it can't be done in language, though. It, has, it needs a guitar. Um, so this is sort of um, for the holdouts, the, the holdout skeptics that are like, being is meaningless. What, what are you talking about? We need language to get through the world. Language constructs our reality, all this stuff. Uh, this is my, my rebuttal to that, uh, to that view, to the holdouts on this view.
So the question is, thank you. The question is, um, is what did that mean? The answer I want to sort of put right in front of the question is, why, why presume the, why make the assumption that, that it needed to mean anything, right? Um, so, I mean, music uh, uh, is a direct um, argument against uh, the sort of tier, the epistemological tyranny of assuming that things need meanings. Uh, the experience of art, in particular, the experience of music. I think jazz has sort of really kind of punched its <laughs> ticket on this, but certainly all kinds of music um, is precisely on the fact that uh, whenever you experience uh, music that has no uh, uh, language inserted into it, that is to say semiotic you know, narrative language, um, sure you can talk about it in terms of a narrative or whatever, but that's really allegorical, it's not analogical. You're not making a direct an analogy between language, you're actually using language as a sort of trope, as it were, as a metaphor for making sense of it. But at its bare reality, the experience of music, the experience of art, I want to argue, is fundamentally meaningless. Most people take this to be sort of, oh my gosh, meaningless, that's terrible. No, it's not terrible, actually. At least I don't experience it that way. Um, it just is, right? Um, this gets us to the second part and to the, 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 the back part of your, uh, of your papers. Uh, that's a picture of my grandma and grandpa wrote you. Um, and uh, they're both, they both passed away uh, in the last uh, three, in the last three years. My little sister drew that. Um, it's a really beautiful picture of them. Uh, she would always sit on the table and she'd do this. And she'd do these little rhythms with her, with her fingers, kind of you know, moving her fingers to a little rhythm. And my grandpa would be there, usually uh, you know, doing stuff, reading the paper. Um, Whenever we think of being and meaning uh, in terms of uh, not just a thing, but also an action, I think it becomes even more relevant. Um, whenever someone you love is dying, for instance, um, let's say they're un unconscious, let's say that there's no possibility for epistemological consciousness-based interaction to happen, there's still a, a very radical and real presence that can exist between uh, the lover and, and the beloved, right, in, in, that, in that moment. And uh, imagine someone trying to insert meaning into uh, one of these sort of occasions of, you know, at, at a funeral or that kind of thing. It'd be rather absurd, I think, actually. In, in, the, in some respects, it might actually be a little bit uh, crazy. You don't need to say anything, is what I'm saying. Silence is enough. So, in my mind, the more radical uh, response than music is in some sense just silence, right? Silence is sort of a direct affront to meaning. Um, be, now we can talk about silence, but that's the irony, right? When you're talking about silence, you're not, it's not silent. So at the level of talking about silence, you can talk about silence in terms of meaning, and you can use meanings, I mean the word silence itself has a meaning, and that's how we communicate in language. Um, so we, so we so sort of run up against this sort of barrier of language, and this is where the next distinction becomes relevant, I think, the distinction between showing and saying. Um, there's a old kind of dictum 
and uh, and writing. Uh, have you heard of this uh, show? Don't tell. Uh, what's the name? Okay, so sh show what you're trying uh, to show. Don't don't tell. Don't talk about this. Show it. Um, this is why I think um, in many cases uh, some of the best phenomenology that's being done is being done by qualitative researchers who are just you know giving very literal accounts of descriptions of, of, of an object or, or just transcriptions of a conversation or stories, for instance, you know, um, uh, show, don't tell. And uh, in many ways, for instance, imagine uh, an experience in which I just talk to you about my grandmother and my grandfather, right, my, my, my grandparents. Um, when you've seen someone, even if it's through a picture, there's a, there's a difference between saying something about someone who has not been shown and saying something about someone who has at least in some respect been shown, right? So uh, looking at them, you can see them in a way um, that you wouldn't have been able to see them had you not had sort of the ability to, to see that which has been shown. So the, the distinction between sh showing and, and saying, saying and showing, is um, in my mind, uh, the distinction we have to deal with for those of us who do our work in language. Uh, so so in the one, on, on, on the one hand, being and meaning, I want to argue, being is meaningless, being doesn't require meaning. You can respond with that, but then the moment you open your mouth, you kind of undo yourself. So then I say, so what do you do with language? Well, you try to use language in such a way uh, where as much as possible, you show more than you say. And in this sense, you try to make your language be more like music. Uh, you try to make your words be more like art in some sense than uh, try and be like Eagle Reese or whatever. And this, I think, is incredibly important, uh, especially for those who have uh, interest in seeing their research and their academic work um, have a sort of, have some value of communicating uh, to those who might not be academics. Um, over the last few years, I've actually stopped reading uh, articles, uh, including some, some of my own. <laughs> I mean, uh, um, I, I've, I've done less work, uh, I've spent less time reading academic prose, and I've spent more time reading poetry, more time reading literature. Um, why? Is it because it's pretty or whatever? No, no, no. The main reason is because I think that in, um, in literary form, that's what language is for, it's to show. <laughs> Whereas in academic form, it tends to be more about saying, right? It tends to be more about deciding or whatever. I don't want to say that we can't, uh, that we have to abandon it completely and all become poets, but I do think that if there's not a sort of poetic concern uh, underlying our work, that we'll have a hard time communicating, right? Um, for instance, uh, this is something striking to me. I find almost no resistance to the idea that education uh, is fundamentally, uh, first of all, meaningless, second of all, has nothing to do with knowledge, third of all, has nothing to do with learning, has just to do with flowing in spaces together. Um, people get that um, who, have, who are largely unschooled or underschooled or whatever. Uh, pe in other words, people who don't spend time in, in, in educational institutions seem to understand education at this very fundamental presence level in ways that a lot of people don't understand think I'm crazy when I go to conferences and talk about this, right? Um, what does that show us? I think it shows us that, first of all, it's, it's not just, um, it shows us in some part a failure of the academy um, to concern itself with communicating. Right? Um, communication to me happens uh, through presence, first and foremost. So for instance, one of the basic assumptions of communications coming out of communication studies and what have you is that communication happens through narrative. Communication happens through, through saying. But I think this is clear that communication doesn't necessarily begin in narrative, actually, or, or, or in saying at all. Communication begins with the sensorial. It begins with, uh, with sight or with touch or with smell or with something. The, 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 the zone of recognition, as it were, uh, is not, uh, in the first place, uh, an epistemological zone of recognition. It's largely an ontological zone of recognition where we see the other, where we smell the other, where we hear the other, the approach, or, you know, these sorts of things. Um, and so I, I think that the, uh, 
the question that, that this all brings in terms of showing and saying is, uh, is something of a criterion we can use to think about our own work uh, and our own studies. Uh, that is to say, um, what have I said? What have I shown? How can I show more and perhaps say less? Uh, to what extent uh, can, I, can I show and not say? That's the point of the guitar. <laughs> that's the point of, of the music, right? It's, it's, it's not a shtick, although it might seem like one, right? But that's, that's the point of it. Um, at some level, I think whenever it's done well, um, we get to the, the final question of uh, what can be said of that which has been shown. I went to a, a concert some years ago in Minneapolis at Cedar Hall. It was a, a bass player, a solo bassist named Michael Mannering, and a Canadian a finger style guitarist, Don Ross. I guess you heard of either one of them. So, uh, so, so Don Ross started, and he played, and he was great. He was, he was a real virtuoso up there. You know? um, he played, he was really great. And Mannering went up and he did his stuff, um, and he was using Evos, those like, they give like a little electronic mint, so it creates like a bow effect on those basses. And he, he had uh, taken two Evos and he put a, um, oh, what's it called, a rubber band <laughs> around the two, and used them to get to like a big field of, of, ele of electricity resonance there. And he played this song that he wrote based on a, uh, a Muslim call to prayer. And it was, the sound was huge. It was. It was just. It was one of those songs where whenever it's over, no one applauded, <laughs> because it was almost as though whenever the song was over, um, you actually regretted that it was over. It was because it was so beautiful that it was. It was just too bad that we couldn't stay there eternally. Almost right. You know, it was this kind of this intense kind of sense of beauty, and so the response to that. Um, uh, he communicated so well that there was absolutely nothing to be said. We just sat there in kind of awe and silence and kind of this pregnant pause full of mixed emotions. Why, isn't, why did that have to end? Oh my gosh, that was great. You know, who knows what everyone else was feeling. But there was probably a, a whole like 10 to 20 seconds of, of just silence that, um, that followed this presentation. And, and to me, I've always thought that that was the answer to the question of what can be said of that which has been shown. Nothing can be said of that which has been shown. Right? Um, in my work, um, uh, my work kind of started actually as a, at, at considering the role of love uh, in education. And here I think we begin to see um, a great deal of, of the answer to that which has been shown. Um, one cannot speak of love. Ultimately love can only be shown. Right? And love which has been said but not shown is not love at all. Whereas love that, that is unspeakable but has been shown is more than, than the love that has been said. Right? We can sort of measure this in a sense. So um, I brought um, some poetry. Um, this is a, a, a poem from William Carlos Williams. He's my uh, favorite English poet, my favorite poet is Pablo Neruda. But, um, but Williams, I think, really um, does a, a, a nice job. And it's, uh, it's the last poem he wrote, supposedly, or one of the last poems he wrote called Asphodel, That Greeny Flower. And uh, it's a poem where he's basically just, this is what people say, he's just trying to be honest, I guess, and, and speak of love, uh, honestly. And uh, so I'm gonna read a little bit to you. I don't think I'll read the whole thing. It has actually, it's, it's a poem in three books. <laughs> um, so it's most of this book. So I won't recite the whole thing to you. But um, I think it'll be good to, uh, to, sh to, to show versus saying, if I can just point out the irony of it. We all notice a difference between when the poet speaks and when the academic speaks. Isn't there such a clear difference between the two? You know? when, when poets recite their, their, their poetry, um, they're speaking, but they're not speaking strictly speaking, right? They're speaking in, in, a, in a very different way of speaking than the way uh, I speak when I teach, for instance, right? Um, this difference in voice, this difference in speech is precisely the, the difference that I think um, I'd like to see my work make, but also in general, I'd like to bring more attention to the fact that work can make this difference. Because I think in, in the academy, we've largely underemphasized the possibility that our, that our, that our speech can show, right? Um, whereas in other arts, it, it's, it's obvious, right, that we're supposed to be. Of asphodel, that greeny flower, like a, of, of, like a buttercup upon its branching stem, 
Save that it's green and wooden, I come, my sweet, to sing to you. We live long together, a life filled, if you will, with flowers, so that I was cheered when I first, when I came first to know that there were flowers also in hell. Today I'm filled with the fading memory of those flowers that we both love. Even to this poor, colorless thing, I saw it when I was a child, little prized among the living, but the dead see, asking amongst themselves, what do I remember that was shaped as this thing was shaped? While our eyes fill with tears of love, abiding love, it will be telling, though too weak a wash of crimson colors it, to make it wholly credible. There is something, something urgent I have to say to you, and you alone, but it must wait while I drink in the joy of your approach, perhaps for the last time. And so, with fear in my heart, I drag it out and keep on talking, for I dare not stop. Listen while I talk on against time. It will not be for long. I have forgot, and yet I see clearly enough something central to the sky which rains and ranges round it. An odor springs from it, a sweetest odor, honeysuckle. And now there comes a buzzing bee, and a whole flood of sister memories. Only give me time, time to recall them before I shall speak out. Give me time, time. When I was a boy, I kept a book, to which from time to time I added pressed flowers, until after a time I had a good collection. The asphodel, forebodingly among them, I bring you reawakened a memory of those flowers. When they were sweet, they were sweet when I pressed them and retained something of their sweetness a long time ago. It is a curious odor, a moral odor, that brings me near to you. The color was the first to go. There had come to me a challenge, your dear self, mortal as I was, the lily's throat to the hummingbird. Endless wealth, I thought, held its held out its arms to me, a thousand tropics and an ap apple blossom. The generous earth itself gave us life. The whole world became my garden. But the sea which no one tends is also a garden. When the sun strikes it and the waves awakened, I have seen it, and so have you when it put all flowers to shame. Two, there are the starfish stiffened by the sun and other sea rack and weeds. We knew that along with the rest of it, for we were born by the sea knew its rose hedges to the very water's brink. There the pink mallow grows, and in their season strawberries, and there, later, we went to gather the wild plum. I cannot say that I have gone to hell for your love, but often found myself there in your pursuit, and I do not like it, and wanted to be in heaven. <laughs> Hear me out. Do not turn away. I have learned much in my life from books, and out of them, about love. Death is not the end of it. There is a hierarchy which can be attained, I think, in its service. It's Gurdon, it's fairy flower, a cat of twenty lives. If no one came to try it, the world would be the loser. It has been for you and me as one who watches the storm come in over the water. We have stood from year to year before the spectacle, the spectacle of our lives with joined hands. The storm unfolds, lightning plays along the edges of the clouds. The sky to the north is placid, blue in the afterglow as the storm piles up. It is a flower that will soon reach the apex of its bloom. We danced in our minds and read a book together. Do you remember? It was a serious book. And so books entered our lives. The sea, the sea. Always when I think of the sea, there comes to mind the Iliad and Helen's public fall that bred it. Were it not for that, there would have been no poem but the world's, if we had remembered those crimson petals spilled among the stones, would have called it simply murder. The sexual orchid that bloomed then, sending so many disinterested men to their graves, has left its memory to a race of fools or heroes if silence is a virtue. The sea alone with its multiplicity holds any hope. The storm has proven abortive, but we remain after the thoughts it roused to re-cement our lives. It is the mind, the mind that must be cured, short of death's intervention, and will become again a garden. The poem is complex, and the place made in our lives for the poem. Silence can be complex, too, but you do not get far with silence. Begin again. It is like Homer's catalog of ships. It fills up the time. I speak in figures. Well enough, the dresses you wear are figures also, but we cannot meet otherwise. When I speak of flowers, it is to recall that at one time we were young. All women are not Helen, I know that, but have Helen in their hearts. My sweet, you have it also, therefore I love you and could not love you otherwise. Imagine you saw a field made up of women, all silver, what would you do but love them? The storm bursts or fades, it is not the end of the world. Love is something else, or so I thought it, 
a garden which expands, though I knew you as a woman, and never thought otherwise, until the whole sea had been taken up in all its gardens. It was the love of love, the love that swallows up all else, a grateful love, a love of nature, of people, animals, a love engendering gentleness and goodness that moved me, and that I saw in you. I should have known, though I did not, that the lily of the valley is a flower that makes many ill who with it. We had our children, rivals in the general onslaught. I put them aside, though I cared for them, as well as any man could care for his children according to my lights. You understand, I had to meet you after the event, and as still to meet you, love, to which you too shall bow along with me, a flower, a weakest flower, shall be our trust, and not because we are too feeble to do otherwise, but because at the height of my power, I risk what I had to do, therefore to prove that we love each other, while my very bones sweated that I could not cry to you in the act. Of asphodel, that greeny flower, I come, my sweet, to sing to you. My heart rouses thinking to bring you news of something that concerns you and concerns many men. Look at what passes for the new. You will not find it there, but in despised poems. It is difficult to get news from poems, yet men die miserably every day for lack of what is found there. Hear me out, for I too am concerned, and every man who wants to die at peace in his bed besides. And it's really, in many ways, the poem itself, I think, actually shows more than I've said thus far. But there are a few things I should probably say to kind of push out of the way that I should have said at the beginning. First of all, my field is education, um, and that's true, uh, I think. <laughs> um, but um, for me, at least, um, I don't consider education to be a synonym with schooling. Schooling uh, is to me a, a, a place where education can happen, but it's a place as, as good as any other place that education happens. For me, education is, is much more than, than schooling, uh, and in some sense much more than pedagogy. It's, uh, it, it's not primarily a way of knowing or a way of learning. Uh, it's principally a way of being, a way of dwelling, a way of making oneself present to others and dwelling with others, sharing with others. Um, the funny part about that people think this is all quite novel <laughs> and, 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 uh, and crazy and groundbreaking. However, um, the more I read of pedagogical history, the history of schools, human history, uh, I just read a great piece on the, the state of the species by Charles Mann on basically a history of, uh, of, of, of life, of bios. So history of bacteria and fungi and all these things. And it seems like bacteria and fungi really get this sense of education really well, right? They really understand that it's about culture, culture, that being in the same space together for a long time to where you build up a kind of mass of something there, right? Uh, that to me is, is basically uh, a thing, first of all, and, and an educational thing, second of all, right? Um, so that's something I probably should have said at the beginning. Um, so then the question of teaching, though, I think is in some sense the question that comes out of how, how does a teacher act like a teacher within a meaningless, beingful <laughs> uh, world? Uh, and how does a teacher concern herself with teaching um, if there's nothing to be said of that which has been shown? Right. And, uh, and this takes me to a story that I heard um, some time ago. Do you guys recall whenever there was that big shooting in, uh, in, at Virginia Tech you know, a few years ago. Um, it's a really powerful story. Uh, there was an emeritus professor there who um, was a Holocaust survivor. And he would teach, I think, like one course every, uh, every other semester or something like that. And he was on the, uh, the floor where the, uh, where the shooter started and uh, he was giving a lecture, the course was full, they were on the ground level floor so they could get out through the window. So he immediately locked the door um, and told the students to open the back window and, and get the hell out of there, right? Um, when the shooter came to his door, he tried to get in, uh, and it was locked, so then he tried shooting the lock, and so the professor, uh, he put his body up against the door, right? bullets or something into the chest and died. Right. And 
so Christ got got out alive and, and he you know, kind of died. So um, a lot of people would want to argue that in some sense that's not teaching. <laughs> that's extra, right? Uh, and in some sense it is. I mean it's kind of extreme. <laughs> it's a it's maybe a limiting case. However, there was something about, at least in potentiality, the idea that um, the idea that your teacher could also become that you could become the beloved of the teacher, right? That's the question. That's the question. The idea that that to teach would require someone who would, in some sense, die for you, right? This is, might seem like a radical question. However, it's not an unprecedented question when we look at teaching as more than this kind of rather modern, professional, bureaucratic uh, practice. But when we think of teaching through its many different lenses that come through us, in particular through folkloric and religious traditions, right? Uh, the rabbinic tradition, the, the tradition of, 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 of um, prophetic teaching, the, prof the, the, the magisterial sense of teaching, you know, these, these senses where the teacher is also in some, is not content alone doesn't make you a good teacher. Wisdom makes you a good teacher, the, 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 the sage. Um, for this, I wanted to talk, to just read a, a bit. This is a book that's in pilot form right now. It's called A, a Primer on Philosophy, and a Primer for Philosophy and Education. Uh, I hope it'll be done by the fall. Um, and it's really short. Um, but this picture that I showed you uh, in this last question are the, uh, it ha it's, a, it's an illustrated booklet. And so um, this is the last piece in the, in the booklet. And uh, the last section of the, uh, of the book is, um, where is it? It used to have 11 sections, but I collapsed the, uh, the 10th section with the 11th. So the last section is titled Being in Love. And, um, and so I just want to read this for you and then have a song and then move into the final thing on phenomenology and focus. And, um, so um, the whole book is in some sense trying to just help students who enroll in my class as my education courses or philosophy courses and get totally freaked out by what's going on to give them a sense of, okay, th this is what it's all about. You can do this, you can think about this, it's very well. Um, it's also for a lot of people who always wonder what philosophy is. And of course, philosophers all wonder what philosophy is too. Um, I've always wanted to teach a philosophy of philosophy cl class. Um, but uh, so this is sort of a philosophy of philosophy section. So, No more, no less, philosophy is love of wisdom. That's of course the very old Greek notion of philosophy. The love that this love begets is understood not known. Understanding is beyond the scope of knowledge because it requires more than knowing. It requires being. Being in love. Uh, quickly, um, knowledge, I want to argue, uh, so I'm, uh, I speak Spanish and uh, come from a Mexican heritage. And so um, in Spanish, we have two words for knowledge, saber and conocer. And saber is the kind of knowledge like, uh, hey, do you saber where the bathroom is? or the washroom, or in Canada, right? Uh, and, uh, and someone will say, oh yeah, I sabe where it is, or can you give me directions, or something like that, right? Um, whereas conocer is the question of, do you conocer, do you know uh, your mother? Well, what do you mean? Do you mean, do I know where she is? Saber, right? No, 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 I mean, do you know your mother? Oh, oh. well, yes, I do know my mother, right? Or perhaps, no, I never knew my mother. Not just because I'm an orphan, but because I, uh, I never knew her. Anyway. So we all know, I think, that there's a difference between the knowledge that takes place in terms of knowing how, where and how to go to the bathroom and the knowledge of knowing um, love or relationships or things like that, right? So I want to argue, though, that understanding is in some sense beyond even conocer. That to understand is, is in some sense beyond knowledge, in some sense also before knowledge. It's more of the order of being beyond the order of meaning. When we drink from the font of wisdom, we are filled with more than wisdom itself. We acquire understanding. So I want to argue wisdom leads us not to knowledge, but to understanding. It is deeper than knowledge itself. By understanding, we become more than wise philosophers and or sage educators. We become persons. We are personalized. We realize that we desire more than just wisdom, more than to move beyond information into understandings. Persons fundamentally desire and require love, to love and be loved. It is better to be in love than to be wise. Without love, there is no understanding. 
True wisdom will not settle for itself. A wise person is not content to be wise. And now for the teacher. My late grandpa Rocha, to whom, uh, to and for whom this book is dedicated, understood and lived this thoroughly. He was not particularly well schooled. He only went up to third grade in school. But he was deeply educated. He was actually one of the last vaqueros, so uh, Mexican cowboys in South Texas, uh, the, the last generation. He was the generation that moved from the ranch to the city. So that, that was my grandpa. Um, he told me countless stories that fill my imagination and heart to this day. He taught me elementary mathematics, penmanship, and how to speak and read Spanish. Most of all, he taught me about life and love and forgiveness and hard work and simple happiness. During his last days, he taught me about the dignity of suffering. He showed me how to die a beautiful death. He was a wise man, a man of incredible understanding. But I will not remember him or his wisdom. I will cherish him or his love. So quick distinction here. Um, it's a shame that I have to keep inserting myself into this. But um, I understand the need for memory. And I think memory is really great. I'm, I'm a big fan of memory. But I think there's a difference between remembering and cherishing. In other words, when I remember something, I, mean, I can remember anything, right? But to cherish something in your memory is, is, is very different, right? And, and in some sense, memory is sort of long-term, short-term. You can quantify it. You can measure it. Some things we remember better than others. And educational research is very interested in how we remember stuff. But to cherish, it goes without saying that you remember. In fact, you can forget to remember the thing that you remember that you cherish, right? You can be reminded of that thing you cherished and you can sort of experience it all again anew, right? This to me is, a, is, a, is something beyond the scope of just mental or epistemological mem memory. This is sort of ontological, being-centered way, way of, of cherishing or remembering. So I will not remember him for his wisdom. I will cherish him for his love. For his love was, is, and will continue to be sufficient. Because of his love, he has been, and always will be, one of my greatest teachers. And so that, to me, is, is, gets us into the, the, the third uh, section on phenomenology and folklore, in particular around the question of teaching, right? So, so if we want to sort of throw down the gauntlet that sort of being is meaningless, <laughs> um, for all the reasons I said, um, and if you want to try out that gauntlet for a little bit, and say, okay, what do I do? Well, show, don't tell, right? Show and say, okay, great. And if you have any educational concerns, and for this, there, for me, everyone has educational concerns, right? Um, that is to say, if you'd like to teach, well, how do I teach? How do I show and not say? How do I sort of do all this through teaching? That's sort of the, the, the model I'm thinking of here. Um, uh, create reasons for which one could be cherished, or which things could be cherished. The cherishing of the earth, the cherishing of food, the cherishing of time, the cherishing of cigarettes, the cherishing of, of, of the drink, the ch to, to cherish each other, right? Um, this is much more than the kind of cold, <laughs> bureaucratic sense of let's spend time together in a room and get, you know, and, and then, you know, log it as time spent together, right? This is very different than that, right? Um, that's why I like that there's, you know, food over there, you know, because it helps <laughs> uh, a little bit. Um, that's why I think music is able to do things sometimes. Uh, I've been at concerts before and heard people play. I played at concerts before, where whenever you're done, holy smokes, you kind of you got there's something happened there that kind of sticks, you know. Um, so um, uh, so this gets into the question of phenomenology and folklore and the supposed uh, gap between them that I want to argue uh, not only is not a gap at all, but in fact needs to be recognized and called a false gap and closed uh, uh, by the linguistic. But, uh, but I'm going to do an, another song to kind of get us there. Um, what song is it? Oh, yeah. This is called um, My Heart Ain't Got No.
Watch hands, don't glue. And my heart ain't got no USB. No, no, no. Pinocchio is fake, but that nose, it seems so real. Pinocchio is fake, but that nose, 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 it seems so real. So sing to me in a dream, awake my soul. From its slumber, sing to me in a dream. Awake my soul from its slumber, a throbbing moment of silence, a uh, weight's invincible violence. Uh, a throbbing moment of silence, a uh, weight's invincible violence. Uh, My heart ain't got no USB. My watch hands don't glow. But my heart ain't got no USB. No, 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 genius of love resonate in your breast may the acoustic genius of a love resonate and bring you eternal rest may the acoustic genius of love resonate in your breast may the acoustic genius Till they rest our hearts are restless till they rest our hearts are restless till they rest our hearts are restless till they rest So that song is in some ways um, this idea of personalization, which I didn't make up. Miguel Di Namuno has the word in his book, The Tragic Sense of Life, personalization. So to uh, once argue that sort of tragedy uh, personalizes. So the only so for, for Namuno, the only person who is a person is a person who has the ability to experience the tragic. Right. The, the tragic is sort of the uh, this, the, the the form of life which personalizes us. So for Unamuno, for instance, suffering is a sort of, uh, not something you should sort of want to want or want to create, but it's the ability to, at least in potentiality, experience suffering and know suffering um, that through that, that which through one becomes a person, right? Um, and, uh, and this is in some sense my idea of, of the teacher, right? The, the, the trope. So who is the teacher? Um, that shows more than they say. Who is the teacher that is, uh, regardless of what they mean or what they mean to say or whatever? Uh, there's a wonderful book by Jacques Rancière uh, called *The Ignorant Schoolmaster*, uh, which is basically a story of this exact kind of teacher, uh, a 
teacher who goes to teach uh, uh, French in Finland, but he doesn't speak their language. And so he teaches them French, but he doesn't know how to teach them. So he just teaches them, right? Uh, the, this idea of, of, uh, of teaching uh, in ignorance, right? That, um, this, of course, runs up against the principal idea that I think has infected in some ways the history of phenomenology and, in some sense, the history of the academy, which is the assumption that education is supposed to make you smart, right? That educated people are smart people. This idea of the ignorant schoolmaster, this idea of the ignorant teacher, uh, the teacher who all I can do is die for you, right? That kind of you know very simple teacher. Um, first of all, I think it's missing these days. But more than missing, um, uh, that notion of the teacher is not there to, uh, to make anyone smart. In some sense, one might even argue that education ought to make us dumb. By dumb, I mean uh, something like what uh, William James calls our dumb intuitions or our dumb feelings. So um, James argues that 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 it's our, our sort of our guts that that get us through things. He, he gives us this uh, wonderful scenario. He says, "Imagine yourself radically feeling it. Now make make a decision, make any decision whatsoever. Right? You know, notice that you can't make decisions." So in other words, the order of being um, privileges intuition over reason. So rationality, that is to say, the things that come after the experience of, 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 of gut feeling, of intuition, um, are governed by intuition. Um, and this is a fundamental insight of, of traditional phenomenology. But I think it's also uh, phenomenology has in some sense tried to redeem intuition. And I don't think intuition is in need of redemption. And so this is sort of me kind of putting my foot down uh, in the kind of phenomenological tradition. And this will be a little bit more heady, I guess, but, but it just... So Edmund Husserl begins the phenomenological movement at the turn of the, the 20th century. Uh, he's coming out of mathematics, studies under Franz Brentano. Uh, uh, basically, B Brentano builds uh, this idea of intentionality. And intentionality is, of course, coming from this kind of Kantian notion of, 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 uh, of intuition, basically. Um, this intuition-based uh, sense of uh, sense of making sense, and um, Husserl, though I think, rightly understood that mathem <coughs> that mathematics or quantification were unable to render descriptions of things themselves, and so what Husserl's desire was was to create a science that could describe things in a more rigorous way than science. In other words. Phenomenology is supposed to, in some sense, be a super science, uh, in the sense that mathematics, in some sense, is one. But it was supposed to give us even better, fuller, richer, more precise, more concise uh, descriptions of things. And so Husserl's big dictum that governs phenomenology is to the things themselves. Right? Let's, let's go to things. Um, I think the general intuition behind that, I think, was, was probably good. And the history of phenomenology has shown us all kinds of huge advances uh, in, in the ways in which we can approach things. We have, you know, Bernal Ponty had a very embodied sense of things and big into the sensorial and phenomenology of, of, of senses. We, have, of course, have Heidegger and, and his kind of throw down on, on being and the question of being as being the governing question of, of, uh, of phenomenology. And so we can only describe things through, through, through ontological research, he calls it. Um, and then you have, you know, of course, Derrida, who, who wants to uh, basically critique Husserl, and in some sense, some people say Derrida is just sort of Heidegger in French, but I don't think that's true. Um, uh, one problem, though, with, with Derrida, a major problem I have in particular, is uh, with Derrida, we see where Derrida tries to, in some sense, domesticate being through language, right? So for Derrida, it's particular in uh, grammatology, he sort of uh, narrativizes reality in a lot of ways. Um, and uh, I think in later Derrida, he, he overcomes some of this early on, but his principal motivation was in some sense to take phenomenology down a linguistic turn, whereas Heidegger took it down almost a kind of mystical turn, although Heidegger late in his life said that language is a house of being, so he kind of took a linguistic turn too. Merleau-Ponty, much more embodied term, he died too early, unfortunately. Levinas takes phenomenology down this e ethical turn. Um, a more recent phenomenology has begun to re-engage with the question of theology, like uh, people like Jean-Luc Marion uh, talking about 
using phenomenology as a negative description of God and as opposed to God without a being. Um, this is where phenomenology has been. Um, but I think the general aim of phenomenology and all these has been to, in some sense, give smarter descriptions. Right. So science and rationality, it's been a very much an enlightenment project. Let's, let's outdo science with phenomenology. Let's make things smarter. Let's get our, make our descriptions smarter. Um, whereas on the other hand, when people think of folklore, um, and, uh, and I'm, I'm not 100% in my depth with folklore, so you might want to press me on what I mean by folklore. Right? Um, but all I, mean by, all I mean by folklore are forms of, forms of life that occur um, within, within the experience of a, a, a within the experience of a, of a cultural form of life. In other words, that whole idea of biology. So I, I consider um, uh, foot bacteria and, and, and fungi to be cult, to be culture and also to be folklore at some level. Right? They just do it. Right? That just they just do. Right? They do. Um, all culture, from from non-human to human, I would argue, has this kind of folkloric sensibility. However, it's not smart. It's not a, it doesn't have, I mean, folk music, for instance, is supposed to be the kind of simple stuff. You move up, you know, you get to high classical music and it's supposed to be, you know, great. Um, so you have this gap between phenomenology trying to become, in some sense, smart, give us a smarter descriptions of things, and on the other hand, you have, um, well, uh, folklore, people just doing stuff. Not trying to not trying to build on the modern project of science, right? Um, you would think that these two things would be sort of opposed to each other, that they would be on, on opposite sides. And so, for instance, there hasn't been a lot of attention uh, to really serious phenomenological investigation uh, for the sake of folklore, because I mean, who wants to read all those books? Who wants to do all? You know, it's kind of silly. Um, my argument, though, is that actually, from the very beginning, Husserl. His first intuition was good, but his next step was off. So instead of trying to formulate the reduction, the phenomenological reduction, in terms of a sort of super mathematics, he should have simply taken a sort of completely anti-philosophical move at the very moment whenever he wanted to kind of get beyond mathematics. In other words, the only way we're going to get beyond mathematics for descriptions is when we get behind math. And, um, and this is, I think, where we're at right now in the present day with regard to the sort of progress of phenomenology. Um, I think we're in the place now where phenomenology has, has done everything it can do, in some sense. It's, um, I think phenomenology is basically worn out. And it's worn out not only by all the critiques of how phenomenologists are only interested in their own experience of reality and all those easy critiques, but the much harder critique is that there's no more things to, to be investigated. We, we've, we've done it all. And now we're just doing what other people did over and over. In fact, in phenomenology, I'd argue, we're more interested these days in philosophers than we are in philosophy. We're more interested in what Heidegger was saying in this one sentence of being in time in relation to, you know, whatever, you know. We're not actually talking about things anymore. You know, we're not, we're not describing stuff. We're, we're not in the things themselves. We're more in, in other phenomenologists' heads who are supposedly in the things themselves. So how do we, in some sense, redeem phenomenology from its false redemption of intuition? Right? That's basically the question. Um, and in my mind, it's uh, through uh, the last turn that I think phenomenology hasn't made, and the turn that will, in some sense, undo phenomenology, which is what I would call the aesthetic turn in phenomenology. So taking the theological turn in phenomenology in the late 90s, kind of beginning with um, people like well, pr primarily Jean-Luc Marion, also people like Paul Ricoeur and other people like that. Uh, Derrida had something to do with that. And the theological turn was controversial, mostly because anytime you talk about religion, you get controversy, you know, whatever. But it wasn't necessarily, I think, sort of as groundbreaking as a lot of people thought it was. And it was still operating in the same sort of discourse of phenomenology all the way back. You, people call Husserl the first reduction, the reduction into objects, and Heidegger the second reduction, the reduction into being. And then Machion is the third reduction, the reduction to givenness. But you notice this kind of linear pattern of kind of one-upsmanship in phenomenology, right? My notion of the aesthetic turn is not a fourth reduction. Uh, it's really uh, simply a, a, a phenomenal, uh, a, what I would call a chastened phenomenology. 
So a phenomenology that's taken its time to happen and has learned a lot along the way and now is going to give up to begin again. Right? This phenomenology that sort of leaves behind the first, second, and third reduction and engages with questions of beauty and not of truth. And this is basically where, where, where phenomenology and folklore, I think, come together. So phenomenology has traditionally been interested in truth or in reality or in the reality of ethics. It's, uh, if you look at the classic uh, Greek ideas, truth, beauty, and goodness, it's been all about good and truth <laughs> and reality. But it's had very little interest in beauty. Uh, sure, there's been phenomenological descriptions of art, and sure, there's been you know, things like that, but there hasn't been a fundamentally aesthetic term. There's been an ethical term, there's been an ontological term, a linguistic term, all these things. I think an aesthetic term, though, is a term that is fundamentally different than all, the, all of them because it basically argues that beauty, insofar as it is, doesn't require anything else. That basically truth and reality and even, even ethics um, uh, are simply meaningful ways of, of being, whereas beauty just fundamentally is. Um, so when you encounter the beautiful, I want to argue, it, it is, it's a, it is the, em the empty or the meaningless encounter with being, right? And that's why, for instance, whenever you encounter beautiful things, there's nothing to be said. Because what can be said of that which has been shown, right? Once something has been shown, there's nothing more to say. Um, in this regard, um, before the last song, um, I think that probably the philosopher who was most interested in this question, the question of, of the aesthetic turn, was not and is not considered a phenomenologist. He's considered actually a linguistic philosopher. <laughs> ironically, uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein, right? Uh, where Wittgenstein, I think, was not interested first and foremost in language. In fact, he understood that language was in some sense insufficient for description and even ins insufficient for communication, right? Um, and I think that what Wittgenstein was really trying to push at and really trying to get behind um, was basically a, uh, an encounter with and an experience of forms of life. What are these forms of life? This is what I want to argue is folklore. Right? And so this, for me at least, um, this engagement between folklore and phenomenology is a place in which folklore, first of all, takes priority over phenomenology because it is, in some sense, completely ontological, completely being-centered. Um, but also uh, where, um, uh, and so folklore is what chastens phenomenology, right? So phenomenology isn't just chastened by by Foucault and all the theorists inside, but it's chastened, it's humbled, right, by, by the arts. If you've ever given a paper alongside a great performance, you'll feel humbled, actually humiliated, right? You get someone who's just really great and just perform something, and then go up and read your paper and see how you feel, right? Even if you do a great job, there's something there, right, missing. Um, and so that's basically um, what I'm trying to do, even as I give this talk, is trying to say, is there a way for the performative and the aesthetic to find a place, not just as a token, but actually find a place as a governing ontological entity that chastens and uh, enforces for the phenomenological, the theoretical, the philosophical, all those things to basically submit to the order of folklore. So how do we submit phenomenology to the order of folk folklore? That's basically the question. It's a repetition, of course, of the question of what can be said of that which has been shown. Right? Um, and this, to me, is sort of the, uh, the work. So um, my last <coughs> final song uh, asks for your participation, if you don't mind. Um, you guys have a little bit of rhythm, I, maybe. I, <laughs> um, so I, I'm going to see if maybe... Hey, this sounds pretty good. So, um, uh, so there's this kind of syncopated beat, so it's going to go... Mm. Oh, I just need you guys to do this thing. Say hello. Yet 
like too much time they squander. Bum, 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 for by the time of fleeting, bum, 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 the alien is no more. Bum, 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 the alien face is fleeting. Bum, 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 the castles by the shore. Bum, 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 and while the alien wishes, bum, bum, sorry, bum, just a while longer, bum, 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 washed like soil tissue. The scent grows any stronger. I mean, my own journey to philosophy of education was largely through some of those, you know, I, did, I, I don't come from an academic kind of family at all or anything like that. Um, 
And so when I was studying philosophy, and that was where I was headed, 100% philosophy, philosophy, philosophy. I had this experience in this class, ironic experience, it was called Philosophy of Community. We were reading Max Scheler's On the Nature of Sympathy and John Paul Sartre's Being and Nothingness, right? So two poems. And I was sitting there, and I, I all of a sudden had this like vertigo experience of like, you know what? There's no community going on here. This is like the m biggest joke of a community ever. This is not a community. We're just talking about community. And, you know, so, I'll, so from that point forward, I basically just like thought philosophy was just stupid or whatever. So, so then I went in and I taught kindergarten through eighth grade. I was a Spanish teacher. And I had this big scholarship. So I went and I studied education at St. Thomas. And while I was there, I got really fed up with all this education talk. And I just thought that it was, it was just really boring and kind of mindless and kind of bean pushing, kind of like, you know, it wasn't, didn't seem very interesting. In other words, I, was, I, 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 I wanted more philosophy and more theory. So then I remember my, my advisor, at the, one of my mentors at the time, said, Sam, I think you're a philosopher of education. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's what sent me there. And so my dissertation, you know, is basically, uh, so the subtitle, it's going to hopefully be come out a as a book here pretty soon. Uh, and the subtitle now is Towards a Folkloric Phenomenology. So an idea of a phenomenology you can talk with ordinary people about, mm -hmm. right? You know, um, so, so yeah, so thanks. I, that's definitely, I'm trying to do. Yeah. yeah. Um, my question, I guess, would be, like, I, I, I think of your work as having enormous political value. Oh, sure. Thinking of politics just in, sure. you know, the way that we mm -hmm. communicate and the yeah. implications that we take. But I would wonder, uh, you know, we've kind of talked about this before, but to submit to the order of the folklore, I guess I'm just wondering, what about when that folklore or that culture is uh, festival. Like, mm -hmm. what about the, the folklore that exists in this university mm -hmm. where the Native Studies Department can't really exist outside of the office? Sure. You know? Yeah. Um, where tokenized kind of gestures are made. You can have this room, uh, you can do your Native Studies stuff mm -hmm. over there. Sure. But when you come into this academic or this administrative building, we're going to talk about the numbers and you know yeah, yeah. The, the enrollments and sure. uh, we're going to hire people based on the quantity of their articles produced sure, and yeah, these yeah. sorts of things. Yeah. And because that's there's still folklore happening there, right? Like there's meaning in the sense that everything is kind of a bureaucratic process, but underneath it all, people are still uh, living in this this realm of being, which I don't know maybe is this like. Dare I say, misguided? You know, like, mm -hmm. what, what would be your thoughts on something like that? Sure. Uh, so quickly, something else I should have said is, um, so the kind of claims that philosophy wants to make, I think, are threefold, and I only have one of them that I have an interest in. So I think there are, you can make descriptive claims, so claims that are basically just describing a thing. Then you can make normative claims, which are describing the norm or kind of ethical claims, kind of like normative. And then of course there are prescriptive claims, so the claims that generally follow from normative claims, but that would say, so here's what you need to do about it, or you know, the sort of like, uh, or basically telling people what to do for their, their philosophical activism or whatever. Um, I'm only, uh, I wanna argue that philosophy should only be concerned with descriptive claims. And a lot of people get really fussy with me and say, well, that's apolitical, and you, well, you can't, you know, if you, but my argument is that actually, descriptive claims can make, can do all the work, all the political work that you want to do, but you show you don't say, right? And, 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 and so it speaks from it. So that's one thing I want to say. So, so my work in terms of its political value, I do think it has political value, but it has a political value that is um, not normative, right? So, and it's not because I don't, I don't think there are normative claims to be made or whatever. I just don't see that as being sort of the, I see philosophy as a descriptive project. And, and I feel very strongly about keeping it that way. That, now, I just had a paper that someone came back and said, you're making descriptive normative claims, you're just not saying you are. Well, of course. But the point is that, is that, is that the, when normative claims sneak into a, des a descriptive claim, or when a descriptive claim is taken as normative, well, that, that's a whole different set of issues, right? Um, so within the descriptive claim, though, um, folklore, for me, is, uh, has to be understood through a historical lens of modernity, right? So... Um, 
really important book for me on this is Ivan Illich's Deschooling Society. I teach it in all my history classes. Um, and Deschooling Society, um, I mean, Nietzsche says this too, a lot of people have said this. There's this kind of really heavy-handed critique of modernity and of modern institutions. And people always say, well, haven't institutions always existed? Well, yeah, they have always existed, but they haven't ex existed sort of in the face of folklore. So I would actually argue that a, that a university institution, a, mo a modern research university, right, like like we have here, is in some sense flies in the face of folklore. It's in some sense anti-folkloric. Right? It's not. It, it was built in some sense to oppose folklore. I see modernity as a project out of the folkloric. So in other words, this is why I think phenomenology in some sense needs to be chastened, right? Because ph phenomenology grew out of the modern Enlightenment project of science and of mathematics and of progress and all these kind of, you know, good European liberal values and all that kind of stuff. And so from my, from my sense of the idea, folklore is not just like a null set or a generic category. Folklore is in some sense uh, the, the exception within modernity. So if you find folkloric spaces, they are sort of the exception. For, for Badu, the idea of the event is sort of the rupture, right, the, 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 the gap in things. Fol um, you find Finding folklore within modernity is like finding events, right? You find moments of like real life. Wow, that's crazy. So you can see it all over. So like organic food, right? I'm gonna go little Jack here. Organic food, right? We fetishize organic food. Organic food is basically just real food, right? But it's become the event. Organic food has become the event. Why? Because it's the exception. Literally, if you walk into the grocery store, I mean, I, I assume, right? You walk in, they have an organic section. So here are here are the real things. Have your pick of the rest, right? You know, but the the exception is the event. And so for me, that's the way I see folklore, right? So folklore is not just any any generic culture. I probably made that seem too generic. Folklore is precisely the event within which you find the exception. Um, so diasporas, uh, 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 all of these sort of you know things happening are are, are, are strange. I, I've. Uh, <laughs> Um, if, if you find people um, uh, dancing together or singing or in some sense just being happy in an institution, you know it's the exception, right? Imagine if someone walked in, I don't know if you enjoyed uh, playing being rhythm. By the way, you were great. You were really good. Actually, I was off time a few times. <laughs> you guys were really good. I, was, I really loved that. Um, uh, I was always scared being this far north. Uh, you know, but uh, anyway, um, I come in from Grand Forks, lots of white people. But uh, uh, the whole point, though, is if someone were to walk in here and see guitar playing and people doing this, it'd be like, "What the hell is this?" It's because it, it's 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 an event, right? And that's what I mean by folklore, right? So folklore is the event within modernity, which is to say, not just the generic event, but the event which becomes the event by its nature of being the exception, right? Um, and so. This, in, in my mind, is sort of this kind of marginal power of folklore, in which it is, uh, it's one of the last events we have, right? So, um, so, you know, this is why I think Zizek is into theology. <laughs> because he understands that, you know, all the critiques you can make of, 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 West, uh, of, of, of you know, Christianity, Catholicism, whatever, more and more and more any religious or theological uh, discourse, and certainly ritual, <laughs> is the exception, right? And so for Zizek, who is a good Marxist and wants to end capitalism, he wants, he wants to say, well, where are the exceptional sites left that can still speak back at modernity, can still speak back to science, can still speak back to capitalism? Where there are going to have to be exceptional sites, and so that's, I think, where he goes into his kind of atheist theology and all this stuff. But, um, yeah, so I, would, so I would argue that in some sense you should want at some level, if the, if the Native Studies Department wasn't on, wasn't a marginal department and you weren't marginalized within an institution, you should in some sense question your identity as a Native Studies Department, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, so it's 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 uh, it, it's 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 terribly inconvenient, isn't it? Like <laughs> it's it's terribly inconvenient, but I think it, um, whenever you just try to whether through assimilation or through political bargaining or through all these things, basically um, uh, take away the exception of the event, 